Is the war in Ukraine destined to become the world's next forever war? Is Ukrainian neutrality and the concession of lost territory, as some claim today, the only way out of the stalemate? Is it incumbent on NATO, as some people argue, to realize that its ongoing growth will continue to destabilize the Ukrainian tinderbox so long as Putin remains in power? These are the questions we will wrestle with today, so buckle up and let's go! Over the past few months, a growing number of people have started questioning the United States' long-term plan in regards to its support for the Ukrainian war effort. What was once seen as a matter of moral certainty and bipartisan compromise has become a divisive subject as the war drags on into another winter and the next tranche of military aid remains held up in the halls of Congress. The crux of the issue centers on the Biden administration's strategy to keep Ukraine's military campaigns from fizzling out. Right-wing conservatives traditionally on board with supporting Ukraine since the invasion began in 2022 have, in recent debates, expressed doubts over the wisdom of spending another $100 billion of American taxpayer money just to keep the situation stalemated. Their doubts compound as they wrestle with the prospect of applying finite means to an undefinable, vague end. Scott Ritter, a former U.S. Marine Corps officer and U.N. weapons inspector, has been one of the more stridently vocal proponents against continued military and financial assistance to Ukraine. In a recent interview, he outlined his controversial view that not only is Vladimir Putin not losing, but despite plenty of evidence to the contrary, he is emphatically winning, and that Ukraine has not only squandered its best chance at peace, but that its continued affiliation with the West will almost undoubtedly lead to the entire country's inevitable ruin. Let's take a look at some of Ritter's claims to see if they hold water. Ritter begins the interview by reviewing what most experts see as the true genesis of the current war in Ukraine, not the full-scale invasion in February 2022, but the political coups that swept over Kyiv and ousted the Russian-leaning president, Viktor Yanukovych, in 2014. Here, Ritter's true colors already begin to show. You see, while most Ukrainians interpret the 2014 Maidan protests as something of a revolution of dignity, one that epitomized Ukrainians' desire to break long-standing ties with an exploitative, overbearing neighbor, led to a return to their 2004 constitution and reflected Ukraine's broader desire for political, economic, and cultural alignment with the West, Ritter sees it in its barest terms. To him, Maidan was not about self-determination and national sovereignty at all, it was all about corruption replacing corruption. According to Ritter, in Yanukovych's stead, the Ukrainians, and to be clear he is quick to lump all Ukrainians generically into a single, faceless entity throughout the interview, decided to elect groups of ultra-nationalists hell-bent on not only purging Russia from Ukraine, but on trying to get Ukraine to, heaven forbid, secure its long-term territorial integrity by joining the NATO alliance someday. The problem, he claims, was that back in 2008, the US ambassador to Russia, William Burns, called Ukraine's eventual accession to NATO a red line, one that would almost certainly inspire a Russian military intervention. That same year, NATO invited Ukraine to join its Partnership for Peace program, PFP, allowing it to participate in joint military exercises, establish political, economic, and security targets to meet NATO's membership requirements, and create interagency and bilateral commissions to improve dialogue and mutual relations. Ritter seems to think that NATO and the West forced Ukraine into entering into these agreements. You know, the way NATO forced Finland and Sweden and all the other Eastern European allies to forsake its ties to the ex-Soviet Union and do the same. Ritter also ignores a lot of the prehistory of Ukraine's involvement with NATO, stretching back to 1991, when the country first gained its independence and, three years later, was already supportive of the other Central and Eastern European nations joining the alliance, even if its own populace desired to become a permanently neutral state. To Ritter, Ukraine's initial involvement with NATO was a trigger moment, one that forced Russia's resort to political manipulation, military coercion, and deadly force. The invasion of Crimea and other military interventions preceding the 2022 invasion of Ukraine proper were, in this light, fully justified measures. Ritter accepts Putin's own rationale for invasion at face value, a play to protect its own interests, and places the blame squarely on corrupt Ukrainian political factions. Ritter gives a bit more context for why Putin framed his invasion the way he did, and of course, it all goes back to the Second World War. You see, there was this guy named Stepan Bandera, a controversial figure born on the eve of the First World War, who during the Second decided that the lesser of two evils would be to align himself with Nazi Germany, 
establish far-right cells of radicalized Ukrainian nationalists, and fight for Ukrainian independence. This, of course, meant doing everything in his power to stop the traditional motherland, the Soviet Union, from gobbling Ukraine back up. Sometimes, when fighting for independence, you have to take the lesser of two evils. In Bandera's case, both sides were simply pure, unadulterated evil, so fighting for an independent Ukraine left him with few options. He chose to align with Adolf Hitler, but Hitler, true to form, wasn't keen on giving up his hard-won Lebensraum and allowing an independent Ukrainian state to be set up in Nazi-occupied Lviv. Hitler soon banned Banderas from traveling throughout the region. He spent most of the war in Sachsenhausen concentration camp, while the OUN, his nationalist group, fought an insurgency against both the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. When you're operating between two totalitarian behemoths, things are bound to end badly. And for Bandera, it mostly did. Most of his followers were killed off one by one, pursued even after the war by KGB agents. Bandera himself died in Munich, murdered by the KGB in 1959. His death was enough to establish him as a martyr and cult hero among Ukrainian nationalists to this day. To some extent, it makes sense. Bandera fought for freedom. Modern Ukrainians are fighting for freedom. Ergo, Bandera serves as an excellent historical symbol for modern Ukrainian freedom fighters who look to the past for inspiration. But of course, history is extremely messy, and Bandera's reputation continues to divide opinion depending on one's national and ideological background. Plenty of Ukrainians, either those who didn't approve of the extremist means Bandera employed to reach his ends, or those with ancestral ties to the former Soviet Union and Tsarist Russia, disapproved of his actions. He wanted a fascist state after all, one with all the same trimmings of the authoritarian dictatorships he was so adamantly fighting against, a state he saw himself leading. His freedom fighters murdered plenty of Jewish and Polish civilians along the way, as part of German police battalions in western Ukraine. Predictably, the Soviets exclusively portrayed Bandera and his followers as Nazi collaborators, which, yes, they were, hence all the anti-Nazi rhetoric when Putin launched his invasion in 2022. And still, many Ukrainians were willing to overlook the context Bandera was operating in and simply focus on the message he espoused, a free and independent Ukraine. To this day, many Ukrainian politicians and other prominent individuals view him as a hero, name streets after him, and commemorate his fight for independence every year on January 1st. Well, at least until the mid-2010s, when pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych had his hero title revoked. Ritter doesn't really care about context or nuance. He sees the more sinister elements of Bandera's ideology still permeating Ukraine's current political and cultural establishment, an assumption that colors his entire conception of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Banderists were released from the Soviet gulags in the 1950s, Ritter argues, in a way that will make conspiracy theorists foam at the mouth, and immediately went back to Ukraine and infiltrated all levels of its society. The United States, embroiled in its Cold War standoff against the USSR, was only too eager to prop them up with CIA assistance. Ritter draws a linear and unbroken line from these ideological fanatics to those leading the current war in Ukraine. He says nothing about Putin's own zero-sum ideology, nor the off-putting political proclivities of his sycophant supporters. He also doesn't mention that Putin's tactic for stressing the illegality of the Euromaidan protests was to call everyone who participated in them banderites thus lumping every Ukrainian who ever sought national independence from Russia into the company of chest-thumping fascists and bloodthirsty ethnic cleansers. There isn't always a causal relationship between ideological fanaticism in the past and power politics today. If that were the case, most Americans would still be Confederates, isolationists, cold warriors or neocons. Some naturally are, but far from an overwhelming majority. Things change, societies evolve, priorities shift, if you ask most Ukrainians who have taken up arms against Russia, chances are they'll tell you they know who Banderas was and understand what he fought for, but to them, this is their struggle, not his. Their families, their livelihoods, their rights were the ones being threatened by Putin's martial ambitions. And so regardless of what Banderas or his followers did, they will fight, like so many revolutionaries, insurgencies and embattled nations before them, because their very futures and lives depend on it. Ritter doesn't really see it that way. In his overly simplistic worldview, because certain groups in Ukraine exist who are bent on outright regime change, that is, they fight to eventually rid the world of Vladimir Putin because they see Putin as the source of all their woes, Ukraine should not be surprised that Putin not only invaded, but that he will never stop short of victory. 
That might help explain Putin's unwillingness to reverse course as steep casualties continue to mount, yet it doesn't make his illegal invasion any more just. Ritter buys into the overblown idea that the West consciously, systematically, and meticulously assisted the election of neo-Bandarite political leaders over the past three decades. U.S. policymakers and intelligence officers, he argues, knew the 2014 coup would pave the way for ultra-right-winged individuals to rise to power. This was, to Ritter's anonymous American manipulators, an acceptable risk. The alternative, pro-Russian leaders dominating discussions and debates in Kyiv, wasn't palatable. After Crimea fell, when Western leaders, as Ritter blithely puts it, begged Putin to give peace a chance, he claims Putin initiated the best-case opportunity for Ukraine to avoid all the bloodshed which befell it after 2022. The Minsk Accords of 2014-15, a series of agreements designed to ease conflict in the Donbass, were signed by Russia and Ukraine, with the stipulation that there be a ceasefire and that free and fair elections be allowed to take place in the occupied regions of eastern Ukraine free and fair elections, proposed by Vladimir Putin. I'll let you be the judge on how you think that might turn out. Ritter is adamant that Minsk was the perfect opportunity for Ukraine to simply relent. Let the elections happen, he argues in a wildly simplistic counterfactual, and Ukraine not only remains a neutral country today, but hundreds of thousands of soldiers would still be alive. Rather, in Ritter's tale, the Ukrainians delayed, deliberated, and obfuscated so they could buy more time for NATO to help them train up an army to stand up to the Russians. The more Ukraine put off the resolution of the Minsk Accords, the more Putin's hand was forced. In Ritter's conception, Putin probably should have actually invaded Ukraine earlier instead of giving Ukraine more time to sign on the dotted line. The problem for Ritter is that literally everyone, except him and Vladimir Putin apparently, knew Minsk was a sham from the start. There were plenty of reasons why the Accords were inherently flawed. They never addressed the root cause of the conflict for one. Putin claimed the violence was all about the aforementioned ethnic conflicts between Russians and Ukrainians stretching back to the 1940s. Naturally, if these ethnic tensions could be settled, the conflict could end, right? According to Wolfgang Spora, himself involved in the diplomatic process surrounding the Minsk agreements, this was pure fiction. The ethnic conflicts that existed in Ukraine, he claims, were no more serious than ethnic tensions in many other countries. If you try to understand the conflict's dividing lines along purely ethnic terms, you'll run into even more challenges. This is not about the Russian versus the Ukrainian language or Ukrainian versus Russian national identity, nor is it about religion, not even in the slightest. At most, one could find something like an Eastern Ukrainian Donbass identity. But this regional identity of the Donbass is not much stronger than strong regional identities in other countries, Spora clarified. What this conflict is fundamentally about is Russia wanting to exert influence over the domestic and foreign policy orientation of the government in Kyiv. In the Minsk agreement, however, this fiction of an ethnic conflict was constructed instead. Although Russia actually had no particular interest in obtaining any autonomy rights for eastern Ukraine, for Russian-speaking or ethnically Russian Ukrainian citizens, Moscow was not only concerned with what was happening in the Donbass, but above all, what was happening in Kyiv. The Ukraine conflict is about the orientation of Ukraine, pure and simple but the Minsk agreement addresses completely different issues. That's why the process didn't work. To add to these problems, the Minsk agreements were riddled with technical issues, an extremely high number of provisions to be verified, the controversial sequencing of certain measures, and of course, the fact that their deliberations overlapped with the COVID-19 pandemic. This may sound banal now, but it's true, Spora adds. It had not been possible to meet in person since the end of 2019 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As little as the Minsk agreements were actually implemented in practice, they did help to build trust. The very fact that parties were sitting around a table had a de-escalating effect. You don't get the same sort of benefit online. For that, you need coffee breaks, shared meals, unofficial contacts and the like. If you lose the seemingly ancillary aspects of diplomatic talks, such a process is doomed to failure. With the Minsk process, therefore, an early warning instrument pointing to a possible escalation of the conflict was also lost. The original Minsk Agreement of 2014 called for a ceasefire and a willingness to withdraw military forces, disband illegal armed groups, and return control of the Ukrainian side of the international border with Russia to Ukraine, all under OSCE supervision. Unsurprisingly, Russia did none of this. It stood up LPR and DPR breakaway forces with little green men and, as a member of OSCE, blocked each of the OSCE special monitoring missions from entering Ukraine altogether.
Ritter claims Russia's invasion in February 2022 was not about occupying Kyiv or decapitating the Zelensky government, which we now know from declassified Russian operational orders that it indeed was. Putin, he says, simply wanted to pressure Kyiv to return to the negotiating table. He cleverly glosses over the illegality of forcibly invading a sovereign nation to achieve that seemingly innocuous end. Diplomacy be damned, as well as the heinous war crimes Russian soldiers committed in the chaotic aftermath. If Ukraine had come to the negotiating table with honest intentions of ending the conflict, Ritter genuinely believes Putin would have given up all the territory he'd occupied since February 24th. They weren't there for territorial acquisition, he argues with a straight face. They weren't there to steal Ukrainian territory. They made a good-faith measure to try to seal the independence and annexation of Luhansk and Donetsk. Putin only wanted a referendum so they could decide, free of any external meddling or political pressure. The Ukrainians naturally walked away from these peace talks early in the spring of 2022. Ritter doesn't say why, but we have a feeling it has to do with the unbroken trend of Russian agents meddling in foreign elections and rigging their own in Putin's everlasting favor. The Ukrainians were duly perplexed. Why should Luhansk and Donetsk enjoy their political independence but not us? That was, after all, the aim of the 2014 protests. If you watch the interview closely, you'll see that Ritter is a huge apologist for Russia. He claims Putin's sole objective in all his dealings was to get Ukraine to the negotiating table to bring an early end to the conflict. He glosses over what this would actually entail for both sides. It was, he goes on to say, only when NATO pressured Ukraine to continue the fight that Russia had to go to phase two. Continuing his special military operation was something Putin never intended or wanted to do. This was his sole mistake, putting all his eggs into a single basket, one might say. The operational disasters that followed were predictable offshoots of Putin's military unpreparedness. Sustaining 20,000 casualties in just a few weeks forced him to reassess his military objectives. Did he want to encircle Kyiv, liberate the entire Donbass? He didn't have enough troops for either. The ones he did have badly mismanaged their operational advance, outrunning their congested supply lines, stretching themselves dangerously thin. He couldn't mobilize more in the short term, owing to Western sanctions and the domestic shock it would incur, which could potentially lead to Moscow's own Maidan moment. Meanwhile, the West injected $45 billion worth of lend lease material into Ukraine's war effort, enabling it to launch a stunning counteroffensive in Kharkiv, which forced Russian forces into retreat. Then and only then could Putin begin a partial mobilization of 300,000 more conscripts. Tens of thousands more volunteered for service. By the end of the year, Ritter puts a lot of stock into the fact that Putin could boast an army of a million men, but doesn't go into any detail over their haphazard military training, shocking living conditions, amateur command and control, or endemic lack of equipment. In the end, the ensuing stalemate has been because the West was unable to provide Ukraine with the massive expenditures of cash and equipment necessary to achieve any form of military superiority over Russia. If Ritter's premise is correct, Putin's initial invasion was predicated on the idea of preventing Western-sponsored regime change, the end of his vice grip on Russia's foreign and domestic affairs. Now, flush with an army of a million men, his industry and society incrementally mobilizing for a long war, and plenty of ammunition and drones to source from North Korea and Iran, Putin is content to prolong the stalemate. He's not losing any territory after all, only hundreds of thousands of men per year. It's down to the West to outproduce Russia, and Ritter, like Putin, is banking on the possibility that Western willpower will buckle before they succeed. Yes, Ritter claims the West cannot produce enough to supply the Ukrainians over the long haul. According to him, Western democracies are giving them old tanks and other armored vehicles that can't stand up to the rigors of modern warfare. He says nothing about the state of surplus Soviet equipment being doled out to the Russian Mobix on a daily basis. Nor does he mention the countless videos which have surfaced documenting Russia's systematic failure to equip and train its conscripts in a meaningful way. To put it bluntly, Ritter plays up Ukrainian weaknesses while glossing over and distorting the true state of Russia's military affairs to support his hypothesis. In the end, Ritter sees no reason for Putin to end the conflict. Sure, Russia's military, one of the primary indexes of its global power, will be robbed of combat effectiveness for a generation to come, but Russia cannot countenance the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO.
Putin offered to withdraw from Zaporizhia, Kherson, Sumy, and the oblasts on the land bridge to occupied Crimea, though its hands were legally bound, there and in the Donbass until a free and fair referendum can be held, all if Ukraine pledges to never join NATO. Russia will work with you. Turkey, the EU, and the US can create their own bilateral security guarantees, but no NATO for you. That was Putin's original proposition. If Ukraine had just said yes and caved to Putin's demands, Ritter believes 400,000 Ukrainian men would still be alive today. There wouldn't have been millions of families broken up, and millions more refugees scattered to the far winds of the globe would still be at home in a safe and secure society. Again, perhaps. But at what ultimate cost? Ritter characterizes Putin's browbeating coercive diplomacy as actually so lenient, his early propositions almost sounded, in his words, like a surrender document. Russia's willingness to work with Ukraine to ensure their interests were protected and their culture could flourish in Crimea and Donbass all but proved they were not out to get an ounce of flesh from Ukraine. It's a tone-deaf take, one that completely ignores the mass killings, the mass looting, and the explicit criminality in the conduct of Russian troops from the start of the invasion. Ritter's opinions fall into line with the likes of Jeffrey Sachs and John Mearsheimer, outspoken realists who have been criticized for their connections to Russia. According to Sachs, the Ukraine war will end when the US acknowledges a simple truth. NATO enlargement to Ukraine means perpetual war and Ukraine's destruction. Ukraine's neutrality could have avoided the war and remains the key to peace. The deeper truth is that European security depends on collective security as called for by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe (OSCE), not one-sided NATO demands. If the Biden administration had not intervened in the March 2022 peace talks between Ukraine and Russia and kept Ukraine on its path to NATO accession, Sachs believes Russia would have simply walked away. Mearsheimer said in 2015 that if NATO enlargement continues, it will end with Ukraine's destruction. Ritter buys these arguments hook, line, and sinker, even though they all hinge on convenient counterfactuals and conspiracies that the war in Ukraine has nothing to do with valid ethical or humanitarian considerations, but all to do with Western greed, money, corruption, and power. The real problem is that Ukraine knows NATO is the only collective security apparatus that has unequivocally worked to guarantee the security of its members over the past 70 years. That's why it won't relent to Putin's demands. The price Ukraine will pay for listening to NATO, Ritter emphasizes, is a frozen conflict with no end in sight. Russia will not withdraw its troops. It cannot legally do so. Putin's hands are tied by the Federal Duma, which has recognized the Donbass regions of Luhansk and Donetsk as part of Russia itself. But when have Putin's hands ever been tied by anyone or anything in the government? Of course, they conveniently are when it perfectly matches his foreign policy preferences. Ritter believes Russia's terms are, and I quote, pretty fair. All Ukraine has to do is completely demilitarize itself, get rid of all the NATO equipment it received, and permanently refuse to ever align itself with the transatlantic alliance. The bigger question is why on earth Ukraine, or any territory adjacent to a volatile revisionist neighbor, would ever agree to do anything so stupid? Leveraging your entire future on the possibility that Putin's personality is really that of a benevolent friend and trustworthy ally seems really fair. Given Russia's history of aggression, why would Ukraine suddenly believe their behavior would change? Wouldn't giving up the ability to defend themselves only open up the possibility that Putin could run this entire war back when the opportunity presents itself? Over the past decade, both states have been on opposite trajectories. Russia descending further into authoritarian autarky, Ukraine trending toward democracy and Western liberalism. This won't simply change overnight because Putin wants a concrete guarantee his Ukrainian brethren won't defect in the future. If he asks Ukraine to simply work toward outlawing the extremists in its society, sure, you can arrest what few war criminals Russia claims exist in Ukraine too, though there'd be far more to prosecute on the Russian side, and you can guarantee they'd never get the justice they deserve. But Ritter thinks only in terms of power politics. The only way out of the war is for Ukraine to become completely neutral and forsake its Western connections, aka become a Russian satellite in Putin's neo-Soviet state. Ritter warns that if Ukraine continues to fight, it runs the risk of losing Kharkiv, Odessa, Mykolaiv, and other crucial cities. Once these cities fall, according to his logic, Ukraine will never take them back. At this point in the interview, we had to laugh, if only because Russia already tried to take these cities and objectively failed. Where will they get the manpower, secure supply lines, or equipment to do it all over again? They can barely stand up a continuous naval presence in the Black Sea as is, 
and that is when Ukraine has no conventional navy. It can't hold Snake Island. It can barely keep its ships docked in Sevastopol without finding out the next morning that one has somehow become an artificial reef on the seafloor overnight. If a forever war is what the West apparently wants, Ritter virtually guarantees that Ukraine will soon cease to exist as a nation. This is historically another poor take. The United States felt the exact same way in Iraq, to say nothing of Vietnam. The Russians did the same in Afghanistan. The French felt the same in Algeria. The British Crown felt the same in the American colonies. The list goes on and on. Maybe, contrary to Ritter's claims, the best chance Ukraine has of surviving as a nation-state isn't buckling to Putin's binding demands, but continuing the fight as an armed insurgency until the Russian public decides enough is enough. The end of Ritter's interview further clarifies the ground he stands on. Rather than see Ukraine's war as a struggle for independence and freedom, he simply sees it as a venue for Russia to get what it wants. As long as Russia doesn't get what it wants, Ukraine, he says, will suffer. Relenting is far better than the alternative. Yet by assisting Ukraine, he claims that the West has, and again we quote, condemned millions of kids to be the kind of kids that grow up without stability, which means they're going to be problem adults. Of course we shouldn't support all those refugees and people from war-torn countries, they're apparently predestined to become menaces to society. Ritter has become a prisoner of the moment. He sees only doom and gloom in the war's bitter stagnation. Ukraine has already lost 20% of its territory. It seems certain to lose another 20% if it continues to fight. There is a growing feeling in the West that Ukraine is losing. At least, there's no longer the unfettered confidence that they can win. Still, it's important to remember that with every advantage over Ukraine at the start of the war, Russia still only controls less than 17% of the country. It has lost 20% of its navy. It has an allegedly world-class air force, with many more modern aircraft than Ukraine, yet it has never achieved a semblance of air superiority, the primary task of any air force. Russia hasn't been able to interdict any of the convoys bringing supplies in from Poland. If Ukraine's counteroffensive has failed, it has failed at the price of hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers killed and wounded, thousands of vehicles lost, and a Russian enemy as equally perplexed as to what it can do to turn the tables of war back in their favor as the Ukrainians are. At the end of his interview, Ritter states that people who support Ukraine are psychopaths. As he put it, people with no moral compass, people with no humanity in them. Scott should look in a mirror, perhaps take a walk around Ukraine and ask the Ukrainians themselves what they think of the Russians. I think you'd get a very different answer.